Hello and welcome to the 2019 edition of our Better Investing Portland chapter education event and annual business meeting. We have a great program planned for you today and we'll begin shortly but first some housekeeping items before we start. When you first enter the webinar, your microphone is muted. The top half of your screen allows you to do a sound check for your speakers, and you may see, ask questions anytime by writing them in the question box that's shown at the bottom of your control panel. Please note that all attendees will be sent a link to the recording of today's event in a follow-up email. In the back room, we have Marcia Cui, Michael Smith, and Phil Palmier to assist Ken and Mark with their questions. To start off, we have a poll designed to help Ken and Mark learn of your level of investment experience. Here we go with our first poll. Marcia, please launch the poll. All right. Let me see if I can get this up on your screen. All right. You should see it now. How many years have you been investing? Yeah, let me tell you. We're new at this, so this is a, just an experiment for us. Choose an option, zero to two years, two to five years, five to seven years, or seven plus years. And submit your response to us. Thank you very much. So I'm collecting responses. I have about 78% of the vote. I need a few more votes and then we can close the poll so submit your responses now please all right five four three two one all righty um, let's share that with the audience you're gonna love this <laughs> we have 90% seven plus years and five percent five to seven years and five percent zero to two years so we've got them mostly the heavyweights down at the bottom all right that was our first poll and that was actually a test for us thanks so much and thank you marcia well yeah we really have a, a highly educated group out there so our education program today is entitled Portfolio Management in a Volatile Market. Immediately following this event is the Portland Chapter's annual meeting, and we hope that you can attend that as well. Before I start, I wanted to thank Ken and Mark for all the work they do sharing their investment knowledge to help educate our investors. And especially the Portland Chapter really appreciates all your support uh, for better investing. Our two investment guys are Ken Cavilla, and Mark Robertson, who are very well known to the better investing community. But just in case you're new to better investing and fundamental investing, let me introduce them. Ken Kavula should be shown on our screen. Can uh -uh. we get our screen back? Ken Kavula on the left has been volunteering for better investing for almost 25 years. He devoted his professional career to education and served as a high school principal for 21 years. Ken is a regular on Ticker Talk, as well as his own chapter's Roundtable and Investment Topics program. He's a popular speaker at chapter events throughout the country and visits at least one club a month with his own chapter. Ken was awarded the Ken Nicholson, Ken was awarded the George Nicholson Award for contributions to investment education, as well as the Dick Dwyer Award and the Ken Field, or Ken, Ken Field Burns Award. On the right, and we still don't have that screen, or at least that's not what's showing on mine. <laughs> I'm Mark having Robertson. trouble closing it. Okay. Mark Robertson is the founder of Manifest Investing, which focuses on investment education to enable, enable investors to experience successful, long-term, fundamental investing. Manifest Investing features an ease newsletter and a provides investment research for stock and fund screening and a resource for portfolio design and management. Mark formerly served as senior contributing editor for Better Investing Magazine and has appeared on National Public Radio, CNB, and ABC ah. to discuss long-term investing. He has worked with Smart Money, Barron's Money Magazine, and Motley Fool, and published features in the Chicago Tribune and a number of local publications. The website is manifestinvesting.com if you'd like to go out and take a look. 
So I'm John Dufresne. I'm your host today. I want to remind everyone there will be a Q&A session following this presentation and you'll be able to ask questions during the presentation. Following that, we'll take a two-minute environmental break and start a short Portland chapter annual business meeting. And again, you are all invited to attend, so please stay with us. Ken, I wanted to thank you for promoting the Portland chapter of Bink this year by wearing the Columbia vest. As you know, Columbia Sportswear is a headquarters here in Portland, Oregon, and their stock symbol is C-O-L-M. And we can barely see that logo right under the I Can Help badge. So take it away, Ken and Mark. Hey, okay. you guys, we still have the uh, poll up. I'm hoping that by changing it over to Ken's system that it's gone. Oh, it's gone. Yay. Yep, it's gone. <laughs> Okay, Mark, uh, just tell me when you want me to switch slides and we'll go that way, okay? Just go ahead and go that way, okay, we're fine then. Okay, well, good morning, everybody, and thanks to the whole Portland team for bringing us all together this morning. You guys are the early birds, three hours ahead of us. Uh, and uh, we just look forward to sharing a few thoughts here. The The experience base of the audience is, uh, is a little bit, uh, Intimidating, would you agree, Mr. Kavula? Absolutely, 90% plus, oh, that's pretty good. That is pretty good. And again, just as we say in many of our presentations, uh, if, if you are a beginner or one of those two years and unders, just be a sponge. If you hear something unfamiliar, go in search of uh, finding the answers that you need, either through your club partners or just people in the community. Well, the subject for this afternoon is, Portfolio management in volatile markets. That's what we're going to kind of kick around. Um, you can see our two guys logo there. Those happens to be the Blues Brothers. Uh, I'm not sure, Ken, which one of them is you or me, but you know, we've, we've been doing this a few years, and uh, the program is a pretty popular feature at, at many of our national events and, and regional meetings. So we will be talking about setting some goals and targets as Ken gets demonstrates some of the features and talks about actually taking care of a portfolio. Forecasting is never easy. We're going to spend some time talking about that. But again, on a little bit of housekeeping, our two email addresses are there. If you do have follow-up questions or would like copies of slides or something like that, please feel free to contact us. Anything you want to add to that, Ken, before we get rolling? Only that if you'd like to come to any of the MidMichigan programs uh, sponsored by MidMichigan and Manifest Investing, uh, all you need to do is send me a note. We'll be glad to add you to our list of people that we remind. Right now we remind people all over the country about our free roundtable programs. We've been doing them for over nine years now. They're, they're very successful programs and we'd love to have you come and give it a try. So if you wanna be added to the reminder list, just send me an email real quickly and we'll add you to the list for the next program. Okay, and we'll start with our standard disclaimer uh, by that audience uh, experience base. You guys have all seen this before, you know the drill. No investment recommendation whatsoever is intended. Everything that we do at Manifest Investing and the National Association of Investors and Better Investing is basically a, a demonstration of uh, a philosophy or a process or an approach to investing, and that, that's what it's about. So please do your own homework. We may hold some of the stocks that we actually show. I believe Ken will be actually using a real local model portfolio in his presentation, so those are companies that are actually held by us, and we'll try to do that. Uh, so any, again, just do your own homework. Here's the agenda for uh, the session. Again, we want to just kind of stick to this notion of, you know, portfolio design and management. You can't have management without design. And what I'd like to do is kind of kick things off with a fairly quick run through of just reinforcement of what are the foundations. Uh, lo and behold, guys, we have now been doing this. And when I say we, I'm talking about the larger, uh, better investing community for almost 80 years. And uh, my experience as your senior contributing editor, uh, I got to meet all kinds of people that have experienced successful investing. As a case in point, Ken is, in, is a member of at least three, if not four. Are you up to th four model clubs, Ken? Three model clubs three I'm in. Models. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last time I checked, all of them were beating the market. It can be done. Uh, when I was senior editor at Better Investing Magazine, I got to watch uh, scores of people um, experience different levels of success. I will share with you, I could take a stack of several thousand investment clubs 
and literally what I would witness year in and year out is the, the least lucky, the most unlucky ones were maybe underperforming the market by a couple percentage points, but there were scores of investment clubs that did manage to beat the market, some fairly considerably, and we, we talked about them in Better Investing Magazine. I'm going to spend just a few minutes reinforcing uh, what is manifest investing, what is it about, where did it come from, and that's what those next two bullet points are, quality matters, that's basically leaning on the legacies of the gurus of, of better investing. Uh, management matters. Excellence in managing a company, accessing a field of opportunity and delivering and executing on results, delivering performance. And this notion of forecasting returns, unleashing imagination. And then we'll switch gears. Ken is actually going to go through and, and demonstrate uh, live from the Manifest Investing website uh, some of the techniques we use to discover companies to uh, more completely study and be very diligent about with the stock search function and then we'll show you how to build a dashboard and how to how to interpret it how to set some targets that kind of stuff and then we'll talk a little bit about common ground with again with demonstration of what we call sandboxes what ifs how everyone to think about it of actually looking at a portfolio what happens if i sell company x and replace it with company y that sort of thing. And as the Portland team has suggested, we'll, as we wrap things up, we will leave the floor open for Q&A at the end. We're going to take just a moment to deal with a couple of technical issues. Mark, I'm going to try to make you presenter again and see if your screen is unfrozen. Will you, will you uh, see what we're looking at now? Okay. You want me to actually scroll to the screen? And, right. Go, to, go through the slides then, Mark, and get yourself to uh, the one that you're going to start on. And and now you have control again, Mark. Okay. Was your screen actually freezing up, Ken? No, but I wanted to make sure that uh, we had the backup if we needed it. Okay. <laughs> Always good to be prepared. All right. So just a, just a moment on doing this for, like I said, almost eight decades for, for the association and the, the larger community. But even going back 40 years, it's just a good reminder. And this is a stack charts. A display of the Dow Jones Industrial Average for 40 years. And I picked a, a special day going back literally 40 years from a month ago to when the death of equities showed up on the cover of Business Week magazine. And I think everybody here agrees that stock prices don't move in straight lines, not even for a group of 30 stocks. There have been some hiccups, some, some ups and downs. You can see the 87 correction in there. You can see the lost decade in the early 2000s, you can see that uh, fairly monstrous moment known as 2008-2009. We'll talk about that a little bit. But uh, my argument would be that even if you invested in the 30 Dow stocks back in the late 1970s, you are still talking about a 8.8 or 9% annualized total return. And that's that's not exactly the end of the world. So again, uh, volatility is nothing new. If we see volatility return in the form that it has been in the past, we shouldn't be surprised by that. Uh, the, the reminder, and again, this legacy of decades of successful investing is that we really don't care so much about this chart. We don't invest in markets. We invest in individual companies, and we'll, we'll spend some time reinforcing that. One of the things that I love to point out, uh, this actually is from an article that I had written back in January 2003 for Better Investing called The Throwing of Towels. And this is another lost decade. This one happens to be the 1970s. We saw the, the larger Dow Jones go flat for the first several years of the, the 2000s. Same thing again. And you can see that these things happen. We shouldn't be surprised that these things happen. And you can see that, that the Dow kind of launched out of a holding pattern in the early uh, 1980s, did the same thing again about 10 years ago. And we actually expected that as a community of investors. We could, you could actually watch how our people treated some of the companies that were in the large cap in indices back at that time. So you can see that, you know, again, you hear this argument that investing in the, the markets, investing in stocks for certain periods of times are kind of a, a loser's game or fraught with risk. And yeah, that's a 2% rate of return on that chart. But one of the things that I find just absolutely fascinating, that's, you know, that's the from the beginning to the end. But if you invest regularly, over that 10 year period that you see in the chart, as opposed to a lump sum at the start, lump sum at the end, it changes rather dramatically from a 2% return to an 11.5% return. 
I would encourage you to go back and read that in the Better Investing Archives, the article, because it's just phenomenal. There's a reason that invest regularly is rule number one. There's a reason that you know Tom O'Hara was able to turn $20 a month starting in February 1948, uh, reaching 1998. He had $1.6 million in his investment club account, $20 a month. That actually only adds up to a $16,000 invested if you actually do the math. So pretty powerful stuff. How is this stuff done? We would basically urge everybody to at least be aware of those founding principles. In uh, this NAIC Investor's Manual, it was issued back around the late 1980s, early 1990s. It's out of print, but you can get copies from uh, Amazon secondhand. It's a great club activity to do. Uh, look it up online and grab a copy of it. I just find some of the words very compelling, uh, strategic, very fundamental, the grand experiment, which came out of Detroit, and uh, the rather bold words that you see there in italics at the from the very first page of the book. And it truly is. The thing that we do is unlike what other people do. The way that we study stocks, the way that we use imagination to build expectations, and we insist on excellent companies. We're always out there looking for better companies at better prices. That is what better investing is about. Ken, is there anything you'd like to add to that? No, except to say that uh, if you discovered this this process uh, early enough and had the luxury of compounding to support the invest regularly, then you're a pretty happy person as you reach your golden years and as you uh, start to draw money from your nest egg. Uh, this, this whole idea of investing on a regular schedule and then having enough time to allow the, the money to compound uh, really makes so much simple arithmetic sense. I'm a mathematician by training and the mathematics behind this, the arithmetic behind this is compelling and it should be enough to answer almost any question from almost any person that is thinking about starting an investment portfolio. Will I eventually be able to retire and have enough money to make it happen? And I think the answer is emphatically yes. I'd agree 100 percent. Just wanted to share and point everybody to uh, many of you in the room are already familiar with this, but this is a presentation made by Benjamin Graham. If you don't know Benjamin, Ben was uh, the mentor of Warren Buffett, um, basically taught Warren Buffett how to invest, or at least part of the approach that Warren Buffett uses. And this is actually from a presentation. You can see it's date stamp. That actually goes back to a few days before the, the Kennedy assassination. I've always found it interesting that he charged a room full of analysts 50 cents per copy for a mimeograph uh, presentation. And uh, that actually works out to be a, the price of a cup of Starbucks coffee now, sticking with our Northwestern theme out there today. Um, just kind of fascinating that he, he did that. But in this paper, which I would encourage everybody to get a copy of, you can reach for the, the stuff at, at the Jason's Zweig site. Um, he really believes in what we do. He's, he's basically one of the few practitioners at least at that time frame and many beyond that time frame that believe that uh, that we in this community can achieve what we do. But he does point out that you really do need sound principles of stock selection and you, you've got to be able to look at the company. Is it excellent? Is it truly up straight and parallel? What what type of price appreciation and total return can I expect? you got to be willing to do that. And second of all, your method of operation must be different from the herd. And I think one of the ways, ways that that is manifested most dramatically is in, uh, I'm going to say love, Ken, love and passion for the smaller companies, the smaller, excellent companies. you got to be willing to go there. You've heard Ken and I talk about that over the last several years. We believe it more strongly than ever. And then, of course, invest regularly in them. So good stuff. Anything you'd like to add there, Ken? No, I think you said it all uh, in a nutshell there, Mark. Okay. And again, uh, one of the other things that we'd like to do is, is think about these foundations and the stuff that we've done over these last several decades. This guy named Walter Schlosh. If you're not familiar with Walter, Google him and uh, take a look at it. The thing that we like to point out by, about Walter Schlosh, he's one of the friends of Warren Buffett. He uh, achieved an incredible track record as a... Uh, private investor, a professional investor over many years. He's in that group of Graham and Doddsville, uh, just super achieving investors over the long term. 
And the thing we like to point out is, is a couple of things. One, he, he invested just like you and I do. He literally used the Value Line Investment Survey as one, almost his sole source of favorite ideas for stocks. And he literally would lick his finger, turn the page. We like to think about that. Many of us have done that. But the other thing we like to point out is just this notion of this ladder of performance. Every incremental gain you can make in, in picking stocks better. Again, quality is not usually the issue. It's usually the price at the time of purchase. Everything, you, the, every advantage that you can gain, buying small enough companies, making sure that you do all the things that Ken is about to talk about, you can climb that ladder. As you climb that ladder, uh, dramatic things begin to happen. I mentioned Tom O'Hara uh, in, in investing in the Mutual Club of Detroit for over 50 years and achieving that one and a half million dollar uh, account. That wasn't the whole club, that was his account. He achieved that by uh, generating a 13% return over that 50 year period. So you can see it was a couple notches up. If you go back in the Better Investing Archives and you take a look at what he had to say about that, he could point to number of numbers of friends and colleagues that actually beat him by a few percentage points. And it just can dramatically uh, increase the number of smiles in your life. All right, so we're gonna spend a little bit of time today. Some of you may have more familiarity with manifest investing than others, but uh, Marcia and the team have asked us to actually talk about three of the main functions, some of the favorite features by investors at Manifest Investing. You see them listed there, dashboard, worksheet, and stock shirts. A lot of this stuff is based on uh, the stuff that's in that magazine cover. Some of you remember that cover. I know that my mom's not the only one that has covers of old covers of Better Investing magazine on her coffee table. They're, they're still there today, by the way. I was just at mom's house a few hours ago. Um, that in fact that magazine is right in their living room and manifest investing kind of grew out of that we're trying to bring the power of the lessons learned over the years and putting put them at the at the fingertips that's what Ken is gonna basically try to demonstrate if you want more information on manifest or if you want a complimentary test drive please feel free to send me an email now, I don't know about you Ken but that's still one of my favorite better investing covers there's been a number of them, Mark, that I still keep around, and that is one one that I do uh, keep around and read occasionally because uh, the, the words are very powerful and the messages are very powerful about what you can do with small amounts of money invested on a regular basis. Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about the, the, the foundations of better investing and manifest investing. We think upstate and parallel companies quality companies are important. And at Manifest Investing, we actually dig in and we follow, a, a, we'll call it a recipe, a recipe for quality that was established by Ben Graham, that Warren Buffett's mentor, and it actually rhymes and actually matches fairly exactly some of the thoughts shared by George Nicholson, one of the founders of the, the National Modern Investment Club movement. And it all centers around these four main characteristics. Forget the the size of the public pieces, they're all basically equally important. Uh, financial strength, the earning stability, uh, consistency of a company over time, and then taking a look at how the company will grow and how they will be profitable relative to their peers, competitor, peers and competitors. We basically stack that up and, and rank them. And uh, the reference that you see at the bottom, one of the things that, that Ken asked me to mention today, and I don't want to go into it other than to urge you if, if you have any confusion at all, perhaps Ken can stop by one of these and show as he goes through the demonstration. We actually do a, a quality rating, which is a kind of like a raw score, and but we rank all of them in a percentile ranking. And if you have any question about that process or what it means, um, that article will actually take you to it. You can actually Google Excellence Manifest Investing and get to it also. But what it comes down to is we like to spend a lot of time with excellent companies, excellent and good companies relative to their peers. And that's what we kind of obsess over. That's the kind of the first feature. All right. I just wanted to share this very quickly to give you some idea of why we do what we do. What you're actually looking at here is taking the companies in the value line investment survey that are non-financials. These are ex-financials. So it's just the industrials. And we're looking at their net margins over a fairly extended time frame of almost 20 years. And you can see how they kind of, uh, well, first of all, they are advancing from left to right, but you can see that they, they do fluctuate a bit and they are trending in a, a very 
very uh, powerfully strong direction on the, the right hand side of the chart. You can also see what the 2008, 2009 recession looks like with that shaded area. That is precisely what happens during a recession. And if you're investing in weaker companies during a recession, uh, some of them can actually disappear from the planet. So this, this slide gives you a little bit of idea of, this is about 1,400 companies of the companies that are in the value line standard edition. Gives you some idea of how they fluctuate, have fluctuated over time and what some of the expectations are. Now the question that's kind of compelling, what if we were able to concentrate our shopping and our ownership slash stewardship amongst only the highest quality companies? Which again, in our work with investment clubs, when Ken and I go out and, invest and visit investment clubs or work with them online, uh, quality is never the issue. We seem to be shopping and spending most of our time amongst the highest quality companies and uh, the good companies because we know that's kind of an insurance policy against uh, disaster. What I'd like, you to, like to draw your attention to here is there's that same chart up at the top with that recession in there, but it's the kind of the answer to what if. The Manifest Investing 40 is the 40 most widely followed companies by subscribers to Manifest Investing. It, it's pre a pretty close parallel for the Better Investing Top 100. I mean, there's a lot of overlap. We tend to follow uh, uh, very good companies, excellent companies. And what I want you to notice is, uh, again, focusing on in on those 40, which are most popular amongst our community, look how the shape changes how much more consistent it gets down at the bottom of the page. In fact, I would challenge you, and we had a discussion with Sam Stovall one time at Standard & Poor's about where's the recession in this one? And I find it almost chilling because I've actually been exposed and part of investment clubs that didn't actually experience that 2008, 2009 downturn, at least not as painfully or dramatically as, as many average investors. Take a look at that scale change on the left-hand side. So we demand up straight and parallel. We demand companies that deliver profitability. And uh, look at the scale change between the two. Look at the relative stability of that group of 40 companies on the bottom. And uh, I just think that's pretty cool. It's kind of an answer to how important is quality. And uh, it, the answer, I hope it's self-evident. You, you want to be shopping amongst excellent companies. Second feature that we want to talk about at Manifest Investing, again, we consider Manifest Investing to be an interpretation of better investing. We think in some cases it's, it offers some interesting potential, perhaps a, a kind of a lookout for some of the vulnerabilities to traditional stock selection guides, but this is Sam Elliott giving us a, a pretty good look at a, a philosophy at Manifest Investing. We think the windshield's as much or more important than the rearview mirror. And when you think about the amount of historical information on a traditional stock selection guide, you want to be careful. And you always want to be looking more to the right-hand side of a, a stock selection guide as you do it. And uh, I think I got the name right this time, Ken. Is that right, Sam Elliott? I think so. I think so this time, Mark. Uh -huh. I used a different Sam the last time we used Sam. And the, one of the ways we point this out is this is one of our favorite slides of all time. You see two selection, stock selection guide visual analyses on the upper left there. And uh, just a simple question, what, you want door number one or door number two? Well, you can read the notes down below. They're the same company on the same day. And the difference between the one on the left and the one on the right is the one on the right incorporates some forward-looking expectations. And we think that that is a urgent, uh, critical aspect of what we do. In fact, with our recent conversion to the Y charts uh, data, we are now gonna be updating literally 2,500 comp companies, literally think of it as an updated stock selection guide on those 2,500 companies every day. And we're always watching for the inflections in the trends that you see on the right. Uh, we, we saw a perfect example of that a couple of weeks ago at Tapestry. I'll be writing about that here shortly. But what this slide is basically asking you to do, it's no more complicated than, I hope you're a Robin Williams fan like I am, oh captain, my captain where he urged the students to walk across the teacher's desk and look around the room in uh, the movie, the name is escaping me now, Dead Poet Society. Be willing to think a little bit differently. I think that this has a potential for a couple rungs on that, that Walter Slosh ladder we were talking about a few minutes ago. So just to underscore, 
we use the preferred procedure for every single company. We look at it manifest investing. We pay attention to the analyst consensus estimates. We really think that using the preferred procedure is the only way. It was preferred. They called it preferred because Nicholson preferred it. Imagine that. And uh, literally, we are looking at what is the impact on the revenue trend or the profitability trend on every single company that we study. And uh, as I said, we're going to be basically doing that day to day. For a little more information on that one, again, you can go to that link at the bottom and uh, dig in a little bit deeper. So again, as we switch gears and we start thinking about portfolio management, I'm often asked this question, what's the most important tool for portfolio management? It is the stock selection guide. It's the expectations that we build for every single company that we do a case study on and drill in a little bit deeper. Again, with the emphasis on those red trend lines at the right hand side. We're basically taking a look at what does this look like and what pressures are there, either up as an opportunity or down as a threat to any one of these, and we're constantly updating them. On the right hand side, you see a, a company, Costco Wholesale, again, sticking with the Northwestern Company theme hometown out there. Um, what you're looking at is a chronicle at Manifest Investing where we basically take a snapshot on a monthly basis. These are uh, monthly study results for Costco. The green price bars are, that you see down here advancing uh, pretty nicely from left to right. And then we keep track of the two core characteristics that we think are probably the most important. The, the quality, we call it the quality EKG. So we want to see a steady or improving quality over time. And then again, the section five results, just like it says right here. The section five results of a stock selection guide, according to the analyst estimates, is all featured right here. So that's the projected annual return graph. So as, as the fundamentals of the company evolve and change, or the stock price changes, we basically see a different stock selection guide result on a monthly basis. So on this chart, the most attractive time to consider buying it would have been, at that point, the least attractive time would have been during that price spike to the upside Right there so that's kind of what what you're looking at as you look at the dashboards and the individual information for companies kind of have this image in your background ken uses a chronicle for virtually every stock he looks at for the round table so anything you'd like to add for add to that ken well i'm going to start my presentation with a chronicle mark so i'll be going right into it in just a moment whoa all right, so with that, uh, we're going to come back to any questions and answers we have later, but uh, I thought I would turn over control to Ken for taking a look at these three basic features, the stock search, dashboards, and worksheets. And I'm basically showing you that he's going to go to Manifest Investing, and he'll be working in these two zones, either stock search or dashboards for dealing with individual companies. So I think with that, Ken, we should switch. Um, do you want to field any questions, or do you want to go ahead and just switch presenters? Uh, just switch presenters, if you could, Mark. Okay. Switching to you, then. You should have approval over there now. And here we go. And uh, this is the home page for Manifest Investing. This happens to be my subscription because we're going to look at some things that are attached to my particular uh, a part of Manifest. And I'm going to start by looking at research. Uh, and I don't even have to go to research on a particular stock because on the home page, it allows me to type in a ticker. And I'm going to type in a ticker of a stock that one of my investment clubs is, is heavy duty into the study of right now. Uh, I'm in a uh, model investment club, and we're doing an industry study of health uh, insurance plans. Uh, and United Health certainly is a stock that a lot of you know. I'm going to just type in the ticker for United Health and hit return. And I'm going to be brought to a page that deals only with United Health. One of the really nice things about Manifest is I can start my search for information about United Health with the United Health page. And this is where I begin many of my SSGs. I start here because I want an opinion from a trusted source. I'm going to move quickly to other trusted sources like Valueline, Morningstar, CFRA, uh, the company itself. But I tend to start with manifest investing because I know the community 
and I know exactly what we're looking for when we're looking for a stock to fit our model of investing. This little spyglass right here is extremely useful. If I were to click this, I would get a list of all the places on the website, including the forum, including all of the articles that are written, including any place that United Health comes up in the literature and it's sorted by date so I can find new things that people in my community are saying about this stock. I'm not going to click that now because I'm trying to keep this kind of streamlined, but I get immediately to the name of the company. I remind myself that this sector and industry classification uh, is Manifest's own sector and industry classification system. It's very similar to Morningstar. They're both very similar to Value Line, and all three of them are very similar to CFRA, but there are unique changes between each of the systems. <coughs> Excuse me, and you have to be aware that they are a little bit different system to system to system. I get a quality number, 97, and this is a percentile number. And when I'm talking quality ratings in large audiences, I'm always talking this percentile number right here. And then I get a potential based on the analyst consensus information that Manifest gathers together I'm getting a potential return number, which I can use to compare to the par number that comes off of either of the tools that I use in better investing to evaluate a stock. Toolkit gives me a par, and the new SSG Plus gives me an average return number, which is par, P-A-R, potential, average, return. I get a current price. I get some lot of other information, but what I'm doing is I'm scrolling down to the quality uh, section of the uh, array, and here's where quality is actually being calculated. Mark told you that quality was four different pillars, uh, and here they are. Each pillar is 25 points, so the most raw score that a stock could achieve would be 100 points, 25 each. The closer that these categories come to 25, the better that category is compared to the industry or compared to the entire database that we're looking at. Financial strength is ranked using the rankings that come from all of our other trusted sources and then compiling them into a simple number and a 93rd percentile financial strength rating for United Health gives the company 23.3 out of the possible 25 quality points. Earning stability, again, collecting the values from all of our trusted sources and then collating them, putting them into a single value, and then percentiling them so that I get, I don't think percentiling is actually a verb, Mark, but uh, I just made enough. up a new verb, okay? <laughs> putting, them, putting them into a percentile so that United Health gives us a 90th percentile for earning stability. And again, 25 possible points. This would give the company 22 and a half quality points. The next two categories compare the company against its own industry. So I look at the industry sales growth, and this industry, healthcare plans, grows at about 9%. Up here, I can see that we're forecasting United Health to grow at about 11%. Well, that's better than nine, so you would expect this to give a few more points than average. Average is right in the middle of those 25 points, so it would be 12 and a half. And so we're getting 15 points because it's growing faster than the industry. Same idea about net profit. Here's the industry 
net profit margin. These companies, these healthcare plan companies run on fairly low profit margins when you take a look at all of them in the aggregate. Well, the average is four and a half percent, and you can see up here that the net profit for our company is 6.4%. 6.4 is better than four and a half, so I would expect better than average quality points. Well, I get 17.8. I add them together and get a raw score, and then I scale that score, that raw score, to get the quality rating of the 97th percentile. In other words, 78.6 quality points are better quality points than 97% of the companies in the database. Only 3% of the companies in the database have more raw score than United Health. It's an excellent high quality company. And then I move down to the Chronicle that Mark talked about. Look at that blue line. That's quality measured over four and a half years. And it's a quality measure taken at the end of each month for the last four and a half years. I'm also getting a measure of potential return at the end of each month for the last four and a half years. And I'm hovering over the last dot, which means that I'm looking at the par, the potential return in August, of 2019 and the par was 13.6. I'm running my eyes across the graph and that's a, a high for the last four and a half years. It's flashing me a signal that this might be a very opportune time for me to buy. The par value for United Health has never been more robust. Now, we can get into the debate uh, that all of your clubs will have about whether or not you'd want to own a health plan company. But the indicators right now are telling me that the potential is at a historic or at least at a five-year high, and it might be interesting. I always use manifest in that manner because I feel it sorts out even from that top group of stocks. Let's go to the places that Mark suggested we take a look at and let's start with search. You're going to need a stock search, Ken. I'm going to need a stock search. Why? Yeah, that's going to point out while he's while he's showing uh to the audience, what Ken is looking at is a collapsed screen where some of the options at the at the top of a regular menu are actually compressed so that they fit on a cell phone. There you go. Uh, and uh, I made it smaller so that I get all the <laughs> the tops uh, coming up. And here is Stock Search. By the way, folks, if that were bigger and you didn't see Stock Search, when you go over to I think right here, stock search would then come up uh, yep. on the tab right here. So there's new stock search. So this is a pretty robust searcher, but I'm going to show you only one thing that I use almost uniformly and that Mark tells me he uses at the expense of almost any other stock search that we do, and that's the manifest rank. Mark has put together a ranking of the stocks, which is a combination of par and quality. It's a combination of high quality stocks selling at potential returns that might be attractive in today's market at today's price. And I'm going to look at just the top half percent. So I'm saying I want to see only stocks in the top one half of 1% that give me this high manifest rank. I hit search and immediately up comes a really nice list. If there's stocks on this list that you already know, then maybe they deserve a second look. If there's stocks on this list that you 
don't know, then I would suggest they definitely deserve a first look. I'm not very familiar at all with Albemarle Chemical Corporation. I just don't know very much about that company at all. After all, I live in Dow country, and the only chemical company that I know a lot about is Dow Chemical. But Albemarle is coming up in this very, very select group of high par, 19.2% par annualized, and high quality stocks. I definitely would want to take a second look at it. Here's yeah, another might, one. Go on, Mark. I just might add a comment about it. I think it's Albert Marley. Um, I okay. might be pronouncing that wrong, but I'm fairly certain they are, one of their specialties is lithium and some of the other very special earth uh, minerals or metals. Rare earths. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the rare earths. So I think that that's a company that it's a, a very worthy study to dig in. And, you know, if you believe that, uh, the, the supply of some of those very important uh, metals for, you know, electronic and computer components. Uh, it's an interesting play, an interesting study. I would, I would highly recommend it. Here's another one that I don't know very much about, Wilden Company, Engineering and Construction Industry. And again, I would definitely give it a little bit of a first chance. I'd submit it to a traditional SSG. I'd go directly to my SSG Plus and put in the ticker and see what happens. But this screen not only gives me high quality stocks, but it gives me high quality stocks that in all likelihood have a strong potential of being in the buy zone. I'm not going to guarantee that every single stock on this list will say buy when you complete a reasonable SSG, but I'm going to tell you the likelihood of it saying buy is much higher when you do a screen like this. Mark just presented Limonera to the round table less than a month ago. This is farm products, and believe it or not, they deal with citrus fruit, specifically with lemons. There's the limon, that's the French word for lemon. So we have a, a nice set of companies, and again, if you do recognize the stock, now maybe is a great time to take a second look at it. It might be that it kind of got into your rear view mirror so far back that you even forgot it might be something you might want to own. Uh, it's a great tool, and there's so much more that you can do with the, with the stock search feature, but I'm going to try to keep focused here. Let's bring those headings down smaller again so we can see them all. I'm going to move to dashboards here, and I'm going to start by showing how you can do a dashboard, how you can complete one. It is so simple, and the instructions are right down the side if, in fact, you forget at any given time. You want to name it, and if you think it requires a description, then write an eight or ten word description. If the portfolio is holding cash, put the cash right there. And if you like the portfolio to eventually be public, that means so that it can be shared with other people, then you might want to check one or the other. I usually start by leaving them both unchecked. I can always go back and check it at any other time once I complete the portfolio. What's so nice now is all I have to do is either do my holdings one at a time or do a bulk holding, which I'll explain in just a moment. Uh, my symbol I would put here and the number of shares I would put here and then add another holding. When I've completed adding the 15 or 18 or 25 symbols that I need, I would hit submit and the uh, portfolio, the dashboard would come to me immediately. Let me show you an example of a completed dashboard, and I want to uh, 
use this completed dashboard right here. And I want to thank the Wise Investment Club of Alpena, Michigan. I'm visiting them this coming Tuesday. Natalie and I are going to turn it into a mini vacation. We're going up north, which is a beautiful part in our state. We're going to spend an afternoon with the Wise Club, and then we're going to go on and do some touring. But the Wise Club has said I could use their portfolio today for an example. So I typed in all of their tickers. I typed in how many shares they had. I hit the button to submit, and up comes the dashboard. I'm going to talk about this block over here to start with, but before I always do anything with a dashboard, I sort it by par values. And I like to see the highest par in the portfolio all the way down to the lowest par in the portfolio. Now, I'm over here looking at what I call the report card. These are weighted averages for some of the most important characteristics of the portfolio. There's nobody from WISE here today, so they're going to hear fresh on Tuesday what I'm telling you today. WISE is aiming to beat the market by five points. and Manifest measures an average stock's return in today's trading. So imagine that Mark did an SSG on all 2,500 stocks in the database, and imagine he put the par value for every one of those stocks on a list from highest to lowest, and then he zeroed in on the number or the name right in the middle, and he checked the par, and it was 8.5%. That's what my par is. It's the average return on the last day of trading. In this case, it's a little bit less than the historic average, which has been somewhere around 95 to 10.5% over the last 50 or 60 years or more. In fact, Mr. Nicholson knew that that return was about 10% back in the 40s when he was putting together the association, and that's where our 15% number came from. Mr. Nicholson suggested that any investment club should have a reasonable shot at beating the market by five points. Well, he knew the average was 10 so he said, let's aim at 15. That's where the 13.5 comes from right here, because we're still honoring Nicholson by saying, if he said we can beat by five, let's make that our goal. And five points above average would be 13 and a half. Nicholson also wrote that you can't be too greedy then it's almost impossible to beat the market by more than 10 points. And that plus 10 becomes the top then of our sweet spot, 18.5. And we have a weighted average of our portfolio. Our goal, 13.5 to 18.5. The actual par value, weighted average, 9.3, we're doing about 1% better than the market. That's not statistically irrelevant, folks. If you can beat the market, period, you're doing something right. So 1% above the market, that's pretty darn good. The goal, and just like in life, we don't always achieve every goal that we set, but we should be adding goals to the list of things we want to achieve that are hard enough that when we do reach those goals, we're, we've, we've achieved something that's really uh, something that we really are proud of doing. So our goal is still 13 and a half, but the 9.3 is the par value that we have in this portfolio. Mark told you that hardly ever 
do we find a better investing portfolio where the quality is below 80th percentile? Our members understand quality and they restrict themselves to those high quality stocks and they put them into their portfolio uh, three to one, four to one, five to one versus any other type of stocks. I look at the top of this list and there are a few lower quality stocks, but for the most part, these stocks are of an extremely high quality and that's what keeps the portfolio par above the market. Here's the one metric that this club needs to really work on. We know that large companies grow on average at 7% or less. And we know that earnings follow sales and stock price follows earnings. And what that means is that eventually the appreciation in stock price is going to follow the growth in sales. If you load your portfolio with stocks that have an average sales growth of just under 7%, then in the long run, you're going to be hard pressed to go above that for your par value. You need to increase the sales growth. And Nicholson even gave us a number. He said 11.5% to 12.5%. We know that you can increase sales growth by adding medium sized companies and small companies to the list of companies that you own. And by doing that, you will boost your sales growth. And in the long run, you will boost your potential average return as well. The other two numbers yeah. that we follow yeah. closely, go on, Mark. Just give you a chance to maybe take a take a sip of a beverage. And just I just wanted to reinforce that, that uh, I never witnessed it personally, but I am told that George Nicholson walked into every single mutual club of Detroit meeting, again, a Detroit area investment club. And what he said to the partners in the club is what small company are we uh, throwing onto the radar screen tonight? They were always, they were constantly pursuing the smaller companies and they would discover smaller companies that would actually become bigger companies. This is a never ending mission. You always have to be out there looking for excellent companies. What I did witness was Tom O'Hara carrying on that same tradition, walking into the conference room every single month saying, what small companies are we uh, gonna discover tonight? So it's a never ending mission. And uh, again, something that needs to be reinforced with the vast majority of individual investors and investment clubs. You've seen this pie graph before, this size diversification graph before in better investing. And most of you know that our recommendation is to have about a quarter of your companies in slow, large, large companies, slower growing, and about a quarter in the small companies, which are much faster growing, 12% or more in, in sales growth. And to have about half of your portfolio in medium growth companies, which would grow between seven and 12%. You can see that this portfolio for this club is overpowered right now by the slower growers and that's what's holding down their growth, which is what's holding down their par. The other two numbers we follow closely are financial strength and earning stability. We set a target of about 80% for them. And this, comp uh, this club does quite well in staying above that target number. And again, most better investing portfolios have no problems with financial strength or earning stability or with quality. It's just this growth number that they tend to deal with and tend to have a little bit of problem with. So we have a table now, how could we use it? Well, there's so many ways to use it and I have 15 minutes to show you as much as I know. So I'm going to be kind of selective, okay? <laughs> 
I'm going to start by telling you that in my club, this goes on our screen. It goes in front of the membership even before the meeting begins. And when the numbers are good, we caucus and we, we talk to each other and we console each other that whatever we do during the meeting, let's just not mess it up. But when the numbers are bad, then we start to think of things we can do to maybe improve the portfolio. We said that sales growth is a little bit low. So I'm going to the growth column and that sales growth, and I'm sorting it from lowest growth to highest growth. And now I'm looking and I'm saying to myself, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven companies that are growing at less than 7%. They might all be tremendously great companies because I know as stock price moves up, future appreciation tends to moderate. I noticed that Apple is on that list of seven companies right now with the predictor of less than 7% growth. I certainly don't think I want to get rid of Apple, which in my mind is one of my core holdings, but I might want to do a little bit of trimming of that particular stock because of its slower growth. I might want to look at Gilead Sciences and Oracle because they seem to have excessively slow growth numbers attached to them. Now that's not an automatic sell, but I can't be afraid in an investment club or in a personal portfolio to occasionally sell stocks to improve the entire portfolio. Notice that Gilead and Oracle make up almost 13% of this portfolio. And I could start to ask myself a few questions and see how I can play. Manifest is the best tool for playing that I know uh, in the investment world. I'm going to come over to this button at the corner up here at the top, and I'm going to press Worksheet. And then to make sure that my worksheet matches the sheet that I just brought up, I'm going to reset the worksheet. Now I'm certain that this worksheet looks exactly like the dashboard that I was just playing with. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to examine the things that have been added to the worksheet. Notice over here, I now can make a holding inactive. I now can remove the holding completely from the portfolio. And I have the ability right here to edit the number of shares. Let's go back and sort by growth again. There's Gilead and Oracle at the top. And let's take and ask ourselves, what would we do to the MyPAR values if we took Gilead's money, about 15,000, and Oracle's money, about 16,000, that's 31,000. What would we do if we took that money and put it into some of the other stocks that we owned? Well, first of all, I'm going to show you how much cash is in this portfolio. At the present time, just under $11,000. I'm going to make Gilead inactive. I'm gonna make Oracle inactive. And I'm now looking at my cash. I now have about $42,000 in cash to play around with. I also, changed my par value for the portfolio. It went down even though I threw out companies 
that had very little growth. Why did it go down? Because that money went into cash and cash is only returning about two and a quarter percent, 2.3 percent. Let's take some of that cash and let's put it into some of the stocks that have higher pars. I've resorted on par. I've noticed that Facebook, and folks, I know this would be more complicated in a club because you'd have a lot of auxiliary, ancillary, and side discussions, but I'm, ex I'm just uh, showing examples of the resources that are available here. Let's put some of that money into Facebook. Let's put 50 shares into Facebook. So I'm going to edit the holding, and I'm going to go from 50 shares to 75 shares, and I'm going to submit. Notice my cash went down. Notice my par went up. Let's put some money into BJ's Restaurant because BJ's is only 1.6% of the portfolio, let's put 200 more shares into here. Let's put 300 more shares into here. 100, wow, adding you're, you're, 300. You're bold on, you're bold on a Saturday bold morning. on BJ's, right. <laughs> and I'm submitting. Notice <laughs> the cash went down the par went up. Let's make one more buy on something that we don't own very much of and something with a fairly high par. I love Illumina. $300 a share right here. Let's put 110 shares of Illumina in here. 110 plus 15 makes uh, 125. Submit. Notice the cash. Oops, I bought too much Illumina. I'm going to go back up here and make this only 75 rather than 125. There we go. Now I have a little bit of cash and I have a little bit of Illumina stock. Notice the par went up. Now, I won't be able to boost that par much more with the extra money that I have, but I've played in the sandbox and I've given my partners something to think about. We can at any time go back and reset this worksheet, and now we're right back to where we were on the worksheet with the 10,000 in cash that they had before we even started playing. And I can play like this for 20 minutes or for a half an hour. And what's nice folks is if you look under dashboards, each of my model clubs has a space where the members of that club can play. Here's the space for the B.I. Baker Model Club. Here's the space for the Mid-Michigan Model Club. And here's the space for my own individual investment club. We can all play. We could have played this game before we came to the meeting, and many, many of our members do. We all have the ability without changing anything in our accounting system. This was the ability to play. This idea of these uh, worksheets is extremely powerful. The only thing I want to show you is when you finally get a worksheet that matches what you want to do, then make sure that you save that worksheet back to the original so that you have a copy of what you did and so that it's there somewhere on your computer for the person that's going to actually do the buying and selling to uh, to access and to use as a as a resource. 
Uh, I think that's what I want to show, Mark, and I'm awfully close to 115. I'm going to do one more thing, uh, if I possibly could, and that's I want to show. Okay, I want to show under research and under companies. I want to show that if I want to, and I'm going to go back to United Health. I can do a stock, oops, wrong one. I pressed the wrong button, folks. I'm sorry. I don't want to go to companies. I want to go to my studies. And here I'm going to put in United Health. And what I have now, folks, is an expanded preferred procedure which shows me the same exact calculation that's used by the SSG Plus to go from sales, here's the sales number, all the way down to a par number, and it includes the dividend. It's a very, very useful tool, and you can play with it and if you don't like the numbers that the analysts have given for manifest, then you have the ability on any one of these right here to alter that number. Let's say that I think seven is a better net margin than the six. Well, then I'm going to change it to seven. There it is at seven right now and the projected annual return has gone from 13.6 to 13.9. You would expect that to happen if margins change. If PE values change, uh, average PE values, uh, right now the analysts are telling us, let's average the PE at 15. If you'd be more comfortable using a 12, then put a 12 in there. hit submit, and you can see that the par value changes from the 13.6 down to a 9%. So I think this is another powerful place where you have the ability to control the numbers and then to validate your SSG and to uh, come up with some other source which gives you an idea about how good your particular SSG is. Already, I look at the SSG that I do, and I want to kind of compare it to the value line conclusions and the Morningstar conclusions. And now I have Manifest to compare it to as well. And I know Manifest is doing the calculation in the same way that I'm doing the calculation. So if my number is 27, and Manifest's number is 13, I'm a little bit worried. I don't necessarily think my number is wrong, but I do want to know why I'm so different than the analyst community. I'm usually very comfortable when I do my SSG, and when it comes out within one or two percentage points of where Manifest is showing the par to be at the same time. We do have about 16 minutes now for questions, so I'm going to go to the questions box, and I'm going to see if we have any. One comment that I will make while Ken is doing that is you, you may notice on the left-hand side of that screen there's some fields that have been corrupted. That's because some of the data sources that we've used have become, um, I'm just going to say, unreliable. Uh, we're, we're in the middle of fixing that. They will be fixed. So the zero percent that you see for net margin and the sh current shares and the current earnings per share, that's simply because the, the data sources we used to use um, have been uh, disrupted. So that, that will be fixed. And we'll probably have a different version of this up at some point, but the core concepts will obviously be unchanged. Well, I was kind of expecting this to happen, Mark, with a very experienced audience. Uh, they've probably heard a lot of this before. 
And so with a very experienced audience, uh, we don't have any questions right now. Oh, okay. Folks, uh, <laughs> if you'd like to type a question in there, we'd be glad to answer it. And if not, I'm going to turn Mark loose. And, and Mark, you want to go somewhere else on your site? It's your site. Uh, it's I know it's your favorite site. So uh, any ideas about where you'd like to go to talk about it? Kick it, kick it back to me then, and we'll go if there's any questions. We certainly Let me have kick it back to you then, yeah. If I can get it to kick back. I can probably make that adjustment if you can't get to it, Ken. Yep, I did you do I, it, Mark? Okay. I just, yeah. I just overpowered you. All right, great. Yeah, because I know there are some very experienced people in the audience and they they may have some thoughts or questions. Um let, let me go ahead and pull up the website. guess we can hear from the Portland team. Is there anything that you guys have on your minds? Well, considering that we are in a volatile market, um, why don't you show us how to use the alerts? Okay. Yeah, and that's... And I, do, I do have a question from somebody in the audience also, Mark, so... Okay, fantastic. Finish the alerts. Yeah, go on. All right, so for any company, again, if you're at the, the company page, I'm going to use Novo Nordisk because that's one of my, my personal favorites that I waited many years to buy. And, uh, again, we're at the, the equity research page that Ken was talking about. You can see it says edit alert. I must already have an alert in here. And you, you can go into the screen and you can actually enter uh, a request to be notified. And this, it'll send me an email if, if whatever I put in here actually happens. And I've actually asked to be notified if the projected annual return goes above 12. It's currently at 7.4. So, again, I want to be nudged if there's something worthy of being nudged about. It, uh, so, for uh, Novo Nordisk, I waited for years and for it to be in the buy zone. It's one of those very steady companies. Look at the Chronicle. The projected return doesn't move around that much, but I actually got an alert back here, back in this time frame, and took ownership back in, uh, began my accumulation back in September 2016. So let me go back and just repeat that. For building an alert on a company, you go into the alert tab and actually enter the condition. One of the other alert uh, conditions that we are beginning to spend a lot more time talking about at the roundtable sessions and, and a few other areas is, what about being notified if the quality begins to drop? Can't explain the quality rating, uh, the ranking, and uh, not such a bad idea. If your company's quality ranking is dropping, that's not anything that's emotional. It's because either the financial strength has gone down or one of those comparisons has gotten weaker or whatever. I just want to know when that's happening with some of my companies. So you can see. See, there's a number of characteristics here. We will probably be revamping this here fairly soon with the Y charts data to give a few more things to sort on. You guys have asked us for buy below and sell above type prices. We probably will do something with that just as an example. But again, as a condition changed, you simply will get an email. Uh, just recently, I went on CVS dropping below quality of 80 for the first time in a very long time. And you can see, just to give you the real life example, CVS using the Chronicle that Ken has shared with you guys. Here you go. So with CVS, uh, again, I'd rather be out fishing, sailing, spending time with my grandchildren, but I kind of like the fact that I got an email, in fact, it was during the last round table meeting that CVS was below 80 for the first time in a very long time. So you can do a stop and think, audit, and uh, just be aware of that situation and act accordingly. So that can come either on the threat side of something weakening or on the opportunity side of something becoming interesting or attractive. What's the question, Ken? Well, we, we're getting a, a fair number of them now. Uh, Norm would like to know, if you go back to the uh, My Studies uh, screen, Mark, Okay. 
and it's just a procedural uh, question. He would like to know, uh, just pull up any of them uh, that you've already done a study on if you want. Mm -hmm. He just would like to know, uh, are, does the green denote the boxes you can change? And he's absolutely right. Uh, the green uh, corners on the boxes are the boxes that you have the ability to change. The ones without the corner are just calculated from the input that you give to the uh, to the box. Yeah, and in fact, on this one, this is air lease. You can see that the source of data has not been disrupted. So you actually do have an earnings growth rate here between current earnings and earnings always five years out. Notice that that data is always going to be five years out. And uh, those are the ones that you can change. Okay. Uh, Vincent is asking two related questions. First of all, he wants to know, do you have model portfolios for high yield accounts uh, or for retirement accounts to focus on high yield? Uh, do you have any model portfolios, and can you use this system for ETFs? Okay, um, we do have model portfolios. I'm not aware of one that that, that focuses in on high yield. Um, it's an excellent topic, though. We actually have some input from uh, some subscribers that we're going to be sharing in the the fourth quarter of this year about retirement related uh, considerations. Uh, and we will actually probably create what was just asked for, uh, a higher yield portfolio. Think of it in terms of uh, uh, people that you know that are getting up there and a lot of experience, perhaps approaching their life expectancy, that they have different investing needs. And they would perhaps be dialing down the growth amounts, dialing up the dividend yields. And uh, yeah, we can demonstrate that. Uh, we have other portfolios like 10 Cup, which is our monthly demonstration of uh, uh, making decisions and running a dashboard on that company, uh, demonstrating now 25 years of investing the maximum amount into a 401k and investing in stocks. You can see that that now is up to a balance of 2.2 million. Uh, so yeah, we do have other model portfolios and we do love to explore things like was just asked about 15 years ago, right around Christmas Day, I was asked, what would you do with a million dollars? We created that bare million, bare naked million uh, portfolio that day, which has maybe five or six transactions over the last 10 years and just an exemplary performance. So yeah, we do take that type of stuff quite seriously. Did I miss part of that question then? No, I think you're you're uh, pretty much on ETFs, Mark. Anything with ETFs? ETFs? A lot of the corruption of our data uh, attacked our funds pretty pretty specifically, but we do, and we will be restoring this um, uh, very completely with uh, with our Y chart stuff. Uh, using the Vanguard growth, it's one of my favorite ETFs to take a look at. Um, some of the data in it's a little bit old. We will fix that, but yeah, we basically created a dashboard for almost any fund. And uh, that's going to get easier with the new data. You can see here's a chronicle on VUG. VUG is Vanguard Growth. And uh, look at that buying opportunity in, in September. When if I had enough alerts on things, I would have gotten a bunch more alerts back in uh, December. So, yes, we do cover funds. We're going to cover them even better. It's going to be pretty cool um, to watch what, what, it, what becomes possible. Mark, could you go One to the my stock? Favorites, keep could you go to the stock go search? Uh, I'm going to clarify something for John on the stock search, okay? Uh, John, okay. We're, we're talking about two related but, but a little bit different concepts. You are asking me for stocks that would have a 99.5 quality rating. And if I were looking for those stocks, under the quality, I would type 99.5. And that means that anything with a quality greater than 99.5 would be screened on. The less than is less left blank, so anything up to 100. So when we submit, or when we search, we get, we get this list right here. Now, these are the stocks with the highest quality in the database. Okay, what I was searching for, and again, it's showing us 
since the quality doesn't uh, uh, use percentages, it's showing us all the stocks with 100 quality ratings right there. And uh, the only one that appears to have a high quality rating and a par that's decent is Monster Beverage, or ha to have a perfect quality rating, a, a hundredth percentile is Monster Beverage. That doesn't mean anything else about how great these companies are. It just means are they selling for the correct price right now? Uh, we tell beginners all the time that the biggest mistake that people make when they invest is to buy great companies at too high a price, and that's exactly what we're talking about. Now, the 99.5 that I put into the stock search <coughs> Got to go to stock search again, Mark. In, in fact, I I do ninety nine point four four because I'm better than Ken. Okay, <laughs> right, that's uh, Ivory. Ivory yeah, so. And, and Mark was just looking. We're now we're looking for those that have a manifest rank. And remember, manifest rank is something proprietary that Mark has put together. It's a combination measure of quality along with par. So they're very high quality companies that also probably are in the buy zone on most reasonable SSGs. So when he does a search on that, he gets a completely different list because we're talking about completely different things when we're yeah, doing the measure. One of the things I want to show you guys, this has become one of my ab absolute favorite default screens. Yeah, I want high return, I want high quality. I also want double digit growth most of the time unless it's a special situation. So I'm throwing a 10% minimum growth rate in and that'll cut the list down. Okay, now we have a list of about a dozen companies to study. And uh, there's some good studies in there without without question. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and Wildan Group that you mentioned is a is a infrastructure type engineering company and they seem to be very good at what they do you know relatively small compared to the floors and the, those type of companies but yeah worthy of a, a much closer look a little bit bumpy because they're somewhat sensitive to economic um, turbulence uh, George would like to know Mark what is happening related to the V charts uh, he means Y charts Y charts uh, yeah, that's what he he wrote Y charts and I read V chart. Okay, go on. Yeah, basically what we're doing is uh, using um, another source of data which will provide the estimates for the end of this year, the end of next year, and the end of the year after that. And in conformance with the analyst consensus estimates, we used to be more heavily influenced by value line, for example, and now we're going to be less influenced by value line. There's still a very important part of the puzzle, but what it allows us to do is have um, a complete database, which is literally updating every day. Um, so we, we really look forward to getting, getting that done. We're in the middle of propagating that through the database. Most of it's done, um, but you will see slight, slight changes in some of the things, but the thing that really uh, captures my attention is when I see a company like Tapestry a couple of weeks ago, I, I could see that the analyst consensus estimates were beginning to drop off for growth rates and a few other things. And uh, lo and behold, about seven or 10 days later, there was a rash of articles in the Wall Street Journal and Barron's. So you literally were a week out, out in front of the bad news. Because sometimes it takes the journalists that long to catch up with what the analysts are doing. That works both ways. Sometimes a story will come out and then the analysts react to it, usually overreact to it. But in any event, we've got a system that will uh, be catching that stuff virtually in real time. That's why I, I published this weekly summary going back to a dark night with uh, Morgan Freeman in front of that screen. And those of you who have seen the movie, that's the scene in the movie where he says it's too much power to be able to watch every citizen on the planet uh, using their cell phones against them. Um, so it's just a, a quick summary of... Uh, what I think might be possible. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. In, the, in addition to that, it basically takes a number of four or six or 20 hour jobs 
and turns them down to a 15 or a one hour job for me. And that's, I think that's good for me. I think that's good for all of us. I think Ken seconds that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Jacob, uh, you say you have a nitpick question for me, but I don't see the question, Jacob. So you're going to have to type it in the question box and I'll be glad to answer it. Uh, Mark, we're also getting a question uh, from some of the back room people. Uh, in a volatile market, how would you be adjusting a portfolio using manifest techniques, or would you be adjusting a portfolio in a volatile market? Well, one of the things I, I think you might want to do is, is bring any notion of volatility that you have and have an open mind and be prepared to discover that markets aren't as volatile as that. In fact, they're less volatile than they've ever been. And uh, we covered that in one of our sessions recently. Um, if you go into any one of our weekly updates, because that should probably make a few of you scratch your heads. If you go down every week, we publish our links to our roundtable sessions. You can see the ones for January through August, along with the companies that were covered. And back on uh, a recent Tuesday, we had our session where we talk about investing themes. This time to cook, crystal blue persuasion, that's what the theme is about. And what we covered was that volatility isn't, as much, isn't higher than it's ever been. And part two to the question is, my answer is, we think differently in this community. And some people think we think bizarre, but I think we think right. And one of the things that we think is that if you're more than 10 years away from your life expectancy, or again, it depends on your personal situation, time horizon, risk tolerance. But for many of us, if, unless you're in that final window, uh, like, like my parents, for example, they're winding down some of the stuff that they do. Unless you're in that, uh, there's no adjustments. You're out there continuously buying better companies at better prices, period. If you're in that window, then maybe you have some things to do, you know, some converting to cash, converting to higher yield, all that stuff makes sense. But if you're not, if you're 20 something, 30 something, 40 something, 50 something, any of that, any in those categories, you shouldn't even care. In fact, you should welcome any perception of volatility as opportunity. That's covered in that session. Uh, we, we see short term price fluctuations, especially when the investing community overreacts and pushes a price way down uh, as an opportunity, not a problem. And uh, that's kind of the way we look at the world. Would you add to that, Ken? Well, only the same things that I said uh, during our, our program. And, and I would urge folks to go to YouTube and look at our most current Turnout Tuesday. It's called Investing Topics with Mark and Ken. And the title is Time to Cook, Crystal Blue Persuasion. Uh, we did a pretty good discussion on on what we feel is causing some of the perceived volatility. Uh, I, I put a lot of uh, onus right on the the 24 hour business news cycle, which feels it has to fill every single moment of every single day and give us a reason every time the market moves 10 points in one direction or the other direction. So. Uh, I, I think that we did a nice job in answering that, and I would urge you to go back and take a look at, at that particular presentation. There we are in our Breaking Bad outfits. <laughs> and Mark, we've, we've gone over by about three minutes, so uh, I want to thank the Portland folks for the uh, invitation to come and, and share uh, our, our presentation with a, a group of folks from out west, and uh, I had a pretty decent time. I'm looking outside. I'm sitting in the bay window in our dinette, and it's one of those rare uh, September days when I should be uh, walking and uh, enjoying the, the the seven great Saturdays we get in Michigan. <laughs> so <laughs> here's here's one of them. So I'm going to say goodbye to everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming, you guys. Um, You're most John, welcome. John, you are self-muted, and you're supposed to thank the boys on our behalf. <laughs> thank you very much for coming today Long on your time beautiful since I've been Saturday. Called a boy. <laughs> <laughs> but we I'll, really I'll appreciate take it. it. 
Well, thank you so much for the invitation and the opportunity. We appreciate it. Bye, everybody. I hope your business meeting goes well. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to encourage our audience to stay for the next uh, portion of our meeting. And uh, we have timed it. It's less than 15 minutes. And we will be having a Q&A afterwards if you can stick it out with us. All right. So I think we're going to take a two-minute break and let you get a glass of water or something to drink, and then we'll be starting our business meeting right away. <laughs>